Hello, welcome to worship. We're so excited. I mean, really, really, really excited that you have chosen to join us today. I promise it's going to be exciting. It's going to be reflective and it's going to be a great time. And so friends, settle your hearts and minds, reflect on Jesus and let's worship together. We're glad you're here. Good morning, church, and I'd like to add to Josh's welcome. Welcome to our worship service this morning. We're happy to have you here worshiping with us and joining God's people worldwide in listening to his voice and singing to him, praying to him, and listening to word faithfully read and faithfully preached. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. We begin our worship this morning by offering our voices in praise to our great God. Join me as we sing, and can it be that I should gain?
Well, let me add my welcome to worship on this first Sunday of Lent. My colleague across the street, Sam Candler, who is the rector of uh, St. Philip's, wrote a newsletter article this week asking the wonderful question, how can we observe Lent when the whole year has been Lent? Well, I'm hoping uh, that our experience is that we're going to appreciate Easter and the months following even more, that all the sounds of the coming season are going to hit us with even richer tones. But for the next 40 days, we give ourselves to the disciplines of Lent, and we invite God's presence now with us as we move into that time of self-reflection. Let's pray together. O oh God of all time and this moment, come to us. Come to us through the screens in our homes. Come into our spirits. Enliven us to your call to come back home. We are most alive when we are in your will and in your presence. So call us closer to both as we worship together. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Miss Heather here for the children's sermon. It's so good to be with you again this morning. Why don't you come a little closer to your screen wherever you are, and it'll feel more like we're together for the children's sermon today. Today, I want to talk to you about your heart. You know, our hearts, they help pump blood through our bodies. But another way to talk about your heart is something that loves something else, right? If you say, I heart you, it means I love you, right? Well, our hearts love God. Our hearts love Jesus. But sometimes our hearts get a little bit messy a little weary, a little worn from the mistakes we make. Oh, those things are called sin, and we don't mean to do them sometimes, and sometimes we just do them even when we know they're the wrong thing to do. And that makes our hearts feel weary and tired and worn, and it looks kind of messy, doesn't it? Well, this reminds me about David, King David in the Old Testament. He had made a really big mistake. And in Psalm 51, he said a beautiful prayer to God. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Well, I've got some water here today. Let's see if we can make this heart that looks messy and weary and worn look new and fresh again. Let's put this heart in the water and see what happens. All right, I've got it in my water and I'm using something to stir it around a little bit. Ooh, some of the messiness is coming off. Let me work on it a little bit more and see what happens. I'm having to kind of jostle it around a bit Oh, this is cool, boys and girls. Check this out. When I put this heart in the water and stirred it around, it became new and fresh and clean again. So beautiful. Now, boys and girls, I hope you know that when you trust in Jesus and you follow him, he will always forgive you. No matter if you've made a big mistake or a little mistake, you can trust in him and ask him to create a clean heart in you. Let's pray and ask God for help this week. Dear God, thank you so much that you can make all things new. Thank you that you can create a clean heart in each one of us when our hearts are tired and weary and worn. When we've made mistakes, Lord, you offer us forgiveness through Jesus. Help us to come to you and ask for forgiveness when we need it. Be with us this week wherever we go and help us to follow you. 
In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. We confess our sins corporately, and I invite you to join me with the words that are on your screen. Join me as we confess our sins together to God. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, and in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and repentant for all that we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light 
and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And God's word assures us of pardon. Listen to these assuring words from 1 John, verse 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. O righteous and almighty God, it's so hard for us to offer these words of confession. So part of our confession is that it's hard to confess. It's so much easier to point out the shortcomings of the other than to look honestly at our own betrayal. So we pray that you would give us the grace to do the hard work of Lent, that our garments might indeed be bleached white by your love. We pray for our world today, first confessing that we're part of the problem, not just other people. We keep stirring political division that erodes us. We keep turning a blind eye to our prejudice. So as we pray for a sick and broken world, let us examine first ourselves. We pray for our church, first confessing that we are part of the problem, not just others. We do not give as generously as you call us to. We do not invite others to church as regularly as we should. We do not embody the good news as often as the occasions present. We do not get on our hands and knees looking for ways to serve and to represent your care for a broken city. So as we pray for our church, let us first examine ourselves. Grant that our confessions will, in your grace, be converted to victory, and give us even now the hints of the Easter miracle that we might live in hope. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> As we prepare our hearts to receive God's word, join me as we sing together, O oh, love that wilt not let me go. the season of Lent, from now until Easter, I'm going to be preaching from the book of Jeremiah. The prophet calls the people to repent, and so it's a wonderful theme for our season together. But it's such a large book, just the Sundays of preaching from Jeremiah, certainly not enough. So on Wednesday nights at 645, there will be a Bible study on the book of Jeremiah. I hope you'll tune in to that as well. But we begin this series and our Lenten season together listening to the words of Jeremiah in chapter 3, beginning in verse 25 and moving through chapter 4, verse 2. 
let us lie down in our shame. And let our dishonor cover us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our ancestors, from our youth even to this day. And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. If you return, O Israel, says the Lord, if you return to me, if you remove your abominations from my presence and do not waver, and if you swear as the Lord lives, in truth, in justice, and in uprightness, then the nation shall be blessed by him, and by him they shall boast. I didn't watch the historic impeachment trials of former President Trump. Uh, I was at work when most of that was going on, but I did uh, watch the news, of course. Early mornings on the treadmill, I get caught up on the news. And I have a personal discipline of watching uh, news from two different news sources uh, with different bias so that I might not get caught up in that vortex of listening to one voice only. What struck me is as the commentators and those on both of these news outlets talked about the trial that was going on as it was going on, both sides accusing the other of having already made up their mind without hearing any argument or evidence. They accused the other side of just listening for things that would support what they were already going to do. I heard one commentator say, this is a, this, this is a, a, a paraphrase, what they're listening for in the presentation is some ammunition to confirm how they're already going to vote. Well, there's nothing new about tribalism. For all of history, we've gathered in tribes, people like us, and defended ourselves against, well, people not like us. And one of the ever-present sins of tribalism is the notion that my tribe is right. My tribe is better. Your tribe presents a threat. I grew up thinking that everybody who didn't speak with a southern drawl talked funny. Because it was my experience. My experience is normal. So, Baptist and Braves fan, white and southern, Protestant work ethic, conservatism and bootstraps, real men and southern gentlemen, these are my people, my tribe. Well, I know it's become a cliche to talk about how the, the many media sources allow us to kind of cloister off in a small room of people who think like us. And there is a sense in which the internet has fueled this reality, but it's by no means a new reality. Throughout history, we've clung to our tribe and attacked the other. This is the backdrop for our story today. Israel has a king. Israel does not have three branches of government. It does not have a two-party system. They have a king. Nobody has to worry about re-election. There's a king and the job is to keep the king happy. Tell the king what the king wants to hear. There's not a cable channel dedicated to dissecting and throwing rocks at everything the king says or does. There's no future in that, in a one-party king system. Well, I mentioned that he doesn't have to worry about re-election, but that does not mean at all that the king has a cushy job. Jehoiakim lived with immense pressure. 
Babylon to the north of King Jehoiakim and the Israelites, Babylon has imperial ambitions and they are aggressive, aggressive and they are trying to press into the land of the Israelites. The Egyptians to the south are desperate to keep uh, Israel as a, as a buffer, but to keep them safe from the aggressive Babylonians to the north. And as the grip of Babylonian pressure tightened, the Babylonians exiled one of the king's sons. The other son, Zedekiah, presided over Jerusalem in the midst of all of this unrest and turmoil and threat. There were temple priests whose job it was to tell the king about the will of God. The problem is the temple priests were on the payroll. The temple priests were paid by the rain. So, as you might imagine, when they're called on to talk to the king about royal matters and God's will, you can just imagine what kind of advice they gave. They gave advice that wouldn't displease the king. They, they told the king not to worry. The God of Israel has made promises to the monarchy. God resides in Jerusalem, they told him. No threat from north or south is going to change that. God is on our side. Those people, those people who are not on our side, they're evil. We are the chosen ones. Remember, we're good. And it is inside this single-voiced echo chamber that Jeremiah raises a harsh, antithetical response. Jeremiah declares that the current adversity has been brought upon the Israelite people because they have betrayed the covenant. They've ignored God. They've turned their back on what is right and what is righteous. It's the sin of the chosen people that's caused this mess. Let us lie down in our shame and let our dishonor cover us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our ancestors, from our youth even to this day. And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. The season of Lent cuts across the lie that the world is a mess because of the evil of others. Lent calls all of us to lie down in our shame and let our dishonor cover us. It is easy and lazy to yell and tweet our disappointment about the actions of others. I've, I've come to love this quote by Russian author Alexander Solzhenitsyn. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds... And it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the div line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? The Israelites had constructed a narrative. We are the chosen ones of God, us good. The Babylonians are the aggressive evil threat, them bad. And the prophet, the prophet challenges the lies of the culture. Not by flipping the narrative, not by saying the Babylonians are good and the Israelites are bad. Only in B Westerns do you have white hats and black hats where there's people who are all good and all bad. No, we are all a part of the problem. 
It's our individual betrayal, our participation in corporate systems of oppression, our conscious sin, our unconscious bias, our betrayal of God's claim on our lives. It's all of that that makes us part of the problem. As Romans says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Lent is the 40-day season where we stare honestly into the mirror of our lives, looking for a true assessment to the reflection we see back. When we see scars of old wounds, we ask if those wounds contribute to the woundedness of others. When when we see sagging where there shouldn't be sagging, we ask, shouldn't my life demonstrate a more muscular faith in the provision of God? When we look back at the shade of our skin and we ask, how does that shade, how does it slant the way I view the world? How how does my lack of spiritual discipline make me sluggish as a disciple? You see, it's, it's honest work in the mirror that leads to the kind of awareness that can move us to something else. Or as Jeremiah put it, (laughs) let us lie down in our shame. Well, it's a fair question, I suppose, to ask why in the world we would want to do this, right? I mean, I, I feel bad enough about myself already Every billboard, every cultural message is telling me that I don't measure up, that I'm not enough. So why in the world would I want to give 40 days to counting off all the rest of the ways that I've been a disappointment? My answer for that is that for all of redemptive history, this exercise has been answered in good news. You see, Jeremiah is not asking the Israelites to wallow, but to confess and repent on the other side of a sincere assessment and an honest confession and a determined new path. On the other side of that is always God's rich blessing. Jeremiah goes on to say this, after calling the Israelites to their own shame, he says, If you return, O Israel, says the Lord, if you return to me, if you remove your abominations from my presence and do not waver, and and if you swear, as the Lord lives, in in truth, in justice, and in uprightness, then the nation shall be blessed, blessed by him. And by him they shall boast. If you stop the selfishness, if you commit yourself to genuineness, justice, decency, If you do not waver, but truly assess and honestly turn back to living like God created you, it will lead to blessing. (laughs) Could you use some blessing? This is the good news. We are guilty. But a loving God is pleading for our return because it ends in blessing. You might have thought that earlier I was uh, dealing in hyperbole when I mentioned that this theme has been 
at work throughout redemptive history. But there is an undeniable pattern in our holy book. Have you noticed a cross? From Genesis to Revelation, there is this pattern. In Genesis, Adam and Eve are told that the day they eat from the forbidden tree, they will die. That's the deal. Eat from this tree, you will die. But when they betray God's hopes, they're punished, but not as severely as they deserved. God gives a sign of grace and a second chance. And then, Adam and Eve's children, not long after this first story, Adam and Eve have sons. They find themselves in conflict, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel, and Cain is punished, sent away, but not punished as severely as he deserved. Instead, God gives him a sign of his grace, a mark, a protective mark and he gets another chance. And then, and then there's this flood in Genesis, right? It destroys all the people except for Noah, his family, and a boat that smells like the county fair. And then at the end of that story, God declares, no punishment like this will ever happen again. And God sweeps the sky with a rainbow, a sign of grace, and gives humanity another chance. I could go on through the Old Testament, but the theme stays alive in the New Testament as well, right? You remember the story about a woman caught in adultery. The law is clear. The law is clear about the severity of the punishment she deserves. But it's Jesus who intervenes. Jesus is the one who intervenes, and she does not get the punishment she deserves. Instead, she gets another chance. Jesus tells the story of a prodigal son who, in essence, has said to his dad, you're dead to me. I want my inheritance now. I'm going to take it and go to Vegas. His guilt is clear. His punishment is a pigsty of his own doing. But the story ends with signs of grace, a, a ring, a fatted calf, a homecoming party. He gets another chance. You know, it would be a good exercise, wouldn't it, on one of these slow at-home quarantine days to just trace this theme all the way, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And I mentioned it's there in that early story of Genesis. And then at the very end of Revelation, the second to last chapter, John says of the holy city, its gates will never be shut. There is always a second chance. Well, the title of this sermon is Elevator Speech. I hadn't mentioned an elevator yet, so maybe I ought to talk about it now. You know what an elevator speech is, right? I mean, like, it, it, it comes from this idea that, suppose you had a great idea, for instance, in your company about a product or a market or something, and you were on the elevator with the CEO of the company and wanted to pitch that idea just before the elevator gets to the parking garage. 30 seconds or so, could you say it plainly, clearly, in a short, succinct way? Or, or suppose you had a really complicated job like in information technology and had to explain it to somebody who has trouble working the remote control. Could you, in just short, clear, concise statement, explain what you do 
So in a lot of different contexts, people have been challenged to create an elevator speech, a, a way of explaining, uh, no matter how complex, a way of explaining as succinctly and simply as possible. Well, here is my elevator speech on why we observe the 40 days of Lent before the celebration of Easter. God loves us enough to give us freedom, to let us go, to follow our own appetites, our narrow tribal instincts, our unrelenting selfishness, our insistence that other people are the problem. Our betrayal leads to punishment, most of it self-inflicted. And God loves us enough to never let us go. The gates will never be shut. God always gives signs of grace, arms wide open, beckoning us home. Honest self-examination followed by confession and new discipline is always answered by God's forgiveness and blessing. God is giving us another chance. As we've already heard together in this time of worship, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is good news indeed. Thanks be to God. We close our worship this morning by offering our voices in praise to God once more. What a friend we have in Jesus. Join me as we sing together.
three things before we go. Number one, set an alarm for just before four o'clock today so you won't miss the all together service with Joshua Scott preaching. Secondly, call the office this week before Wednesday if you're not already getting the link to the Zoom on Wednesday nights. Wednesday at 645 begins the Bible study on Jeremiah, the book I'm preaching from uh, all through Lent. And third, in these bleak winter months, would you look for ways to be the church to one another? Think about somebody who pops into your mind who you don't usually talk to through the week and reach out and give somebody a call. The weather and the pandemic have created so much loneliness that a call from somebody within this family of faith would mean a lot to somebody. I urge you to pick up the phone. Go now in the beautiful confidence that God has given you a second chance. Don't squander it. Be grateful. And go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
God like Jehovah. There's no 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 God like Jehovah. Nobody like him. No God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Nobody like our God. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Nobody like him. No God like Jehovah. No way. No God like Jehovah. Robert Smalls was a hero of both the Civil War and of Reconstruction. In 1874, he was elected to the United States House of Representatives from the state of South Carolina. Just 12 years before, he staged one of the boldest and most imaginative escapes in the history of slavery. Its daring and its timing were unbelievable. Robert Smalls was a 23-year-old slave pressed into service for the Confederacy aboard a ship called the Planter. For nearly a year, Smalls quietly observed the movements of the ship and its crew. Just before dawn on May 13, 1862, Smalls took his chance. While the ship's officers slept ashore, Smalls and his fellow enslaved crew members pulled up anchor and eased the planter into Charleston Harbor. The plan was that he and the other enslaved members would meet their family members and take off and sail to Union territory. He knew that there would be danger ahead because he had to pass through four Confederate checkpoints. He dressed up like the captain, he even walked like the captain so that it looked like nothing was wrong. Smalls slipped past the first three checkpoints undetected. The most dangerous checkpoint remained, Fort Sumter. 
As dawn broke, the crew urged Smalls to take a wide berth, but Smalls knew the changing course could arouse suspicion. Smalls gave the signal. A few seconds later, the signal came back, pass on by. As the ship approached Union territory, Smalls replaced the Palmetto and Rebel flags with a white bedsheet that his wife had brought on board, narrowly avoiding cannon fire. Smalls, his family, and the entire crew of the planter were now free.
everybody. Thank you for worshiping with us. We pray that this service has been connecting to you. And I want to continue along that same line. We want to talk today about miracles. I know, spoiler alert, we've already talked about miracles, but we're going to continue that discussion today, speaking specifically about magnificent miracles from the steel sun. Now, hey, don't click off the browser. I know many of you are saying the steel sun, what? I know, the sun does not usually remain still. The sun moves, but it moves at a very slow pace. <laughs> the sun, in fact, is a gas, and it moves in regions and at different rates in those different regions. This is why the sun can be shining in London, and it can be nighttime in Atlanta. The sun moves at an alarming rate of 483,000 miles per hour. And the miracle is, we don't even feel it. The sun is a miracle in and of itself, but to say that this moving gas can remain still is something most of us would say, no, nah, Josh, I don't believe that. Hmm. I want you to believe it because you're gonna see today in Joshua chapter 10, verses one through 15, it in fact is true. Hmm. Joshua and Israel experienced the sun standing still all for the benefit of them. Hmm. The miracle of the steel sun is something that most people don't preach about, a lot of people don't teach about because it's a miracle and people really just don't understand it. But for a minute, I'm not gonna ask you to divorce your scientific lens, but I am gonna ask you to factor in that there is a God that sits high and looks low and that is sovereign. You see, to give you a bit of backdrop of this story that's happening in this narrative, these awesome people have experienced some magnificent miracles. I'm talking about they've experienced the parting of the Red Sea. They've seen the baton of leadership be passed from Moses to Joshua. They've seen the miracles of spies going into Jericho, not getting caught, not dying, and actually returning back to Joshua. They've experienced the magnificent miracle of crossing the Jordan, a great body of water on dry ground. <laughs> they've noticed the wall of Jericho come down, not by physical strength, but by the strength given by God. Israel is not new to this, they're true to this, and they have seen God birth some magnanimous blessings and some magnificent miracles. But we arrive to chapter 10 in the book of Joshua. And I want you to see in chapter 10, beginning at verses one through five, digest this, because it's so relevant to our lives. People will attempt to destroy what God has placed together. Mm. I want to say that once more. If you were on your living room and you're on your living room couch and you didn't catch it, hey, clear the earwax out of your eye, out of your ears and catch this. People will attempt to destroy what God has placed together. We see this truth lived out and, and we can examine it in Joshua chapter 10, verses one through five. You see, as God unifies, there will always be obstacles, opposition, and challenges that attempt to divide. But in 2021, we need to factor that in, not be surprised by it, but learn how to continue in faith. And so let's look at Joshua chapter 10, verses one through five. The text says that when King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem heard how Joshua had taken eye, and had utterly destroyed it, doing to Ai and his king as he had done to Jericho and his king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. He became greatly frightened because Gibeon was a large city, like one of the royal cities, and was larger than Ai, and all his men were warriors. So King Adonai of Jerusalem, he sent a message to the king of Hoham of Hebron, to King Piram of Jarmuth, to King Japhia of Lachish, and to King Deber of Egalon, saying, Come up and help me, and let us attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jermuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Egalon, gathered their forces and went up with all their army, armies and camped against Gibeon and made war against it. 
Y'all, I know those were some weird names. I know it was a whole lot going on. We're about to break this thing down. Friends, Joshua's reputation of being a great and effective military leader has spread widely, friends. You see, Gibeon once had issues with Israel, but recently they buried those issues and made peace with Joshua and all of Israel. Unity is being practiced and unity here is being lived out. Now, understand today that Gibeon was a large, a great city. In fact, in verses one through five, you hear it described as one of the royal cities. It was way bigger than Ai, and Joshua had already conquered Ai. This large city collaborating with Joshua and Israel placed fear in the king of Jerusalem's heart. King Adonai of Zedek, he was scared. I mean, he was shaking, his knees were knocking together. And we have to understand from just King Adonai of Zedek, the one of Jerusalem, understand this, that when people are scared, insecure, or fearful, they would normally seek to get other people involved to stop the threat from happening. Hmm. Friends, when King Adonai of Zedek, he understands that Israel has joined forces with Gibeon, he says, O-M-G, oh my God. He says, fellow kings of Hoham, Jarmuth, Lashish, Egalon, listen, y'all, please, please, please help me. He says, I'm in a tight spot, y'all, because Gibeon and Israel, they have decided to collaborate, and if they turn against me, y'all, they're gonna annihilate me and my people. I don't need your help tomorrow. I need your help today. That's in contemporary terms what this king is saying. And these kings, they, they say, all right, brother, we're going to help you. They gather with their people ready to make war and to catch the combined army of Gibeon slipping. But if you stop right there, don't you see unity is happening. Gibeon and Israel, they've come together to function in unity. And I feel like, you know, the man off the sitcom of the 90s, why can't we all just get along? But realize this, that insecurity will always be an enemy to unity. Hmm. Friends, we must accept the truth that the late Ghanaian diplomat Kofi Annan once offered. He once said that insecurity is love dressed in a child's clothing. Hmm. Friends, our insecurities prove the need for maturity. King Adonai of Zedek, his, he's throwing a temper tantrum at the moment. He's invited other kings to the temper tantrum party. But lean into this character for a moment. Have you ever found yourself acting like King Adonai of Zedek? Hmm. Have you ever found yourself being led by your insecurities? It's so easy to do. Friends, we must determine in ourselves to seek unity and not be led by insecurity. Our world needs more collaboration, not more division. And although some will attempt to destroy collaboration and unity, we must not lose hope or trust in the unity that God desires. Let's challenge ourselves this week and beyond to be in unity with God, but to also be in unity with each other because if we seek to be unifiers, we will come to the understanding of this great truth that the sovereignty of God will always reign supreme. Hmm. I'm going to say it again, y'all. Y'all catch it. It's right here on the screen. The sovereignty of God will always reign supreme. You see, God's sovereignty is on full display at this moment in verses 6 through 11. But let's define what it means to be sovereign. When we describe God as sovereign, what we're saying is that God is able and capable to do as much or as little as God desires to do whenever God desires to do it. It's saying that God has free reign. It's saying that God is able to withhold or to cause for something to happen. See, in verse six, the people of Gibeon request Joshua's presence. <laughs> They're saying, Joshua, oh Joshua, we're in deep trouble here. We have this huge combined army. I mean, it's five kingdoms put together to equal up to our demise. <laughs> and they're saying, listen, it's five of them and we cannot fight this by ourselves. So we're desperately pre pleading to you. 
Do you hear? These are some pleading kings, right? <laughs> These kings are supposed to be so, uh, uh, but they're just pleading, just crying, just crying. But here, here's the thing. <laughs> I like Joshua because Joshua drops what he is doing in Gilgal. <laughs> And he literally travels to Gibeon on these people's behalf. And listen to the text message that our sovereign Lord drops in his inbox in verse eight. He says these words, the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them for I have handed them over to you. Not one of them shall stand before you. Do you hear those words? Hmm. Those are words are of comfort and they give Joshua and his army strength because they traveled all the way from Gilgal, all the way to Gibeon in the nighttime. <laughs> and so they're traveling all night, probably tired, probably thirsty. If they like me, their feet are hurting, they're sweating. They probably hadn't had their midnight snack like I like to have at two o'clock in the morning. They can't have none of that stuff, y'all. They're moving, they're walking, they got some pain, but the Lord said, don't fear them. <laughs> he said, I have given them over to you. You don't have anything to worry about. You see, they're walking and they're walking. And I imagine if I use my homiletical imagination, nation, that the sun has not fully risen as of yet. The people have not wiped the crust from their eyes. The people are moving gently, Joshua and Israel. They're walking gently, Joshua and Israel. And suddenly they creep up on this combined army. <laughs> and the Lord sends this combined army into panic mode. And this army is, they're designed to be mighty. They're designed to be strong. They're designed to be undefeatable, but they find themselves defeated in the worst way. <laughs> this combined army is five countries, y'all. They're running, they're dying, they're screaming, and they're hollering as the sovereign Lord did exactly what he promised in verse eight. The sovereign Lord told Joshua, he told this combined army, this combined army may be big, but they're no threat for God. Nothing is too hard for God. The army may be mighty, but they will be defeated today. And in verse 13, you get to hear more of the story. Actually, not verse 13, but verse 11, because in verse 11, we get to hear that it says that as they fled before Israel, please catch this, while they were going down the slope of Beth Haran, the Lord threw down huge stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the Israelites killed with the sword. Do you hear that? <laughs> Human strength, you, friends, it has limits. <laughs> Human strength can get you only so far. But the magnificent miracle of God is that when our strength stops, when our strength fails, God's strength keeps on going. <laughs> friends, in our text today, we get to see the sovereign Lord reign supreme because it tells us that God caused a hailstone from heaven, he, many hailstones, to kill this combined army. This is interesting, man, because it's really the armies were combined. There was no reason for Joshua and Israel to be victorious in this. It was no reason for them to really have any type of victory, but it was because of God's sovereignty that they were able to experience victory. It says more people were killed by what God was doing than what Joshua and Israel ever did. Hmm. Oh, please don't miss that because that's the miracle in the text. And I don't know about you, but I've seen this lived out in a multitude of ways. I have personally been in spaces where people have been better. They've been faster. They've been greater. They had more friends than me. <laughs> they had more people that they knew. And I ain't know nobody <laughs> but God. And I have seen God take the person that didn't know anybody, the person that was not faster, the person that should have been in second or last place and put them at the top of the pack. Hmm. You may ask, well, maybe it's because you're gifted. No, baby, maybe it's because I know God. Hmm. And friends, I want you to catch this, that God has a way of putting you exactly where God wants you to be. It doesn't always matter about how strong and how mighty somebody may be. It doesn't always matter about how great that other people may say that somebody else is. You better know God, <laughs> because when you know God, God can do what people can't do. God can open doors when people shut them. God can renew when people say it's all over. God 
God can cause things to come back to life when everybody said it was dead. Joshua knew God. And because he knew God, he was able to experience the magnificent miracles of God. But here in the text, it teaches us something, that God is sovereign. And in God's sovereignty, it will always reign supreme. God will never be in second, third, or fourth place. God's going to always be in first place. Why? Because God is God. Hmm. Friends, I want you to catch this today that magnificent miracles are seen in the text. You get to see <laughs> that Joshua and Israel were able to have victory against a five kingdom army. Hmm. That's big, y'all. But we've even seen the essence of God, seeing that God is sovereign, meaning that he can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. But yet, Here's the hope in the text right here. In verses 12 through 15, we get to understand today that God's sovereignty is not just for Joshua and them. It ain't just for your mama and them. But God's sovereignty surrounds all of us. Look at what happens as the text shifts forward and then looks backwards. In verse 12, beginning there, it says, On the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord. And he said in the sight of Israel, sun, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in mid heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded a human voice for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. What we just read and what you just saw together is the miracle of the still sun. Hmm. The sun standing still at Gibeon while Israel defeated a five nation army is a magnificent miracle by God. People, scholars, people that were just angry have debated this section of scripture for so many years. Some people say it's impossible for the sun to actually stand still. Mm -hmm. Some people say this miracle is just not valid. And if you really think about it, we use terms that are indicative of the sun moving, don't we? In the morning we say, the sun is ro is, it rises, the sunrise. Some people have even, back in my father's day, they had sunrise service. Woo, blessings to you saints that went to those services that early in the morning. <laughs> but then, they have sunsets, right? We even take pictures. You know, I got one friend that's a photographer. I won't say her name, but she loves taking pictures of the sunsets. I'd be like, oh my God, I wish I was on the beach that you're on right now. Mm. Sunrise, sunsets, they're indicative of the movement of the sun, right? And so we hear these people saying it couldn't happen. We, we hear Joshua's story, but I want to push you right now. And I want to say this, don't miss the miracle point of the text because you so caught up in the semantics and syntax of the words. I want you to understand that the point that we need to understand is that for Joshua and Israel, a miracle one did happen and two, God's sovereignty was on display. How you may ask, because God prolonged the day. <laughs> in an effort to assure and to assign victory to all of Joshua and all of Israel. That's the miracle. <laughs> you can keep your debates for someone who cares because it ain't me. I want you to know that God does things every single day that blows our minds and cannot be calculated on a human calculator. God chose in his sovereign way to say, hey, at this moment, son, you stand still. <laughs> God sovereignly prolonged this day and it surrounded Joshua and Israel and all the people at Gibeon in a way that assured victory for them. This miracle of the still sun is a testament to the sovereignty of God. It shows us that there is no place that we can go that God's sovereignty doesn't meet us already there. It shows us that God sits high and looks low and cares about the intricate and important and what we think are non-important views and circumstances of our lives. God's sovereignty proves that we serve a big God. But as we think about God's sovereignty, we must understand that we have to learn to listen to this big God too. Because God speaks through people. He speaks through his word. He also speaks through circumstances. When I graduated high school, 
I had a friend that did not immediately go to college. He chose to take a gap year. And he went with a group of friends and some trusted parents to Germany. And as he was in Germany, this group visited a botanical garden. This botanical garden had 15 feet to 20 feet hedges, and they created this maze of sort, similar to the one you see in this picture. And so they went inside this maze, and it was always fun for groups to go inside the maze to see who could get out the quickest. And the group that he was with, everybody got out except my brother here, my friend. And when they got out, it was a platform. They could go all the way up to, you know, the top of the platform, and they could look down and see the people trying to get out the maze, and they could give them instructions as to how to find the outlet so that they wouldn't be stuck in the maze. Well, my friend <laughs> that I'm telling you about, he wasn't real quick, y'all. <laughs> and all his people, they are outside of this maze. And so the sun began to set. <laughs> and he started getting scared. Now, this brother, he's about 6'6", six, six, and at this time, he's about 280. Ain't no reason for him to be scared, right? He's a big man, right? He should be there. I'm all right. I'm going to find it. But he couldn't find his way out. And so he told me, he said, man, Josh, I started, I began to get a little fearful. I, I began to start saying, man, what if it gets dark and I'm stuck in this thing all night? <laughs> and so all of a sudden, at his most fearful point, he heard a young lady that was in his group say, hey, listen to the voices from above. And he listened to these voices from above and it directed him directly to the outlet. <laughs> Friends, oh please, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta catch this because that'll preach right there. Different times in our lives, we can find ourselves in different mazes of circumstances, different mazes of trouble, different mazes of pain, but we need to learn how to listen to the voice from above. Because when we listen to the voice from above, it attests to God's sovereignty. When we listen to the voice from above, it attests to the miracle work of working on our behalf. When we listen to the voice of above, it doesn't matter what maze we may find ourselves in, God has an answer to get us and provide instructions for us to get out. And I want you to know that this is the God we serve. And if you don't believe it, uh, you're invited to this Holy Ghost party because if you don't believe that the Lord always has a remedy and a solution to our problem, just think about our sin issue. <laughs> and when we had a sin issue and found ourselves in the maze of sin that equal to our death, God sent from on heaven all the way to earth a sacrifice in the form of Jesus. <laughs> he sovereignly sent our Savior to come down to tabernacle with us just a bit. <laughs> he healed while he was here. <laughs> he raised people from the dead while he was here, but yet Jesus hung on a cross for you and me. And he hung on that cross and bled and died, not because he did something wrong. He hung on that cross because we did something wrong. Friends, I want you to catch this today. There are many mazes of life, but there's one God. There's one God that can lead us out of every maze that we find ourselves in. God's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. If he wants to cause the sun to stand still, he can. Mm. If he wants to send Jesus to die for the sins of humanity and raise him up on the third day, just because you can't conceptualize it don't mean it didn't happen. Mm. God is so divine. He's so awesome. God is so big that God functions sometimes out of the scope of the human brain. But what we need to learn how to do is understand that, yes, there's a knowledge above college and understand that, hey, even when we don't get it, we can attribute it and say, that was God. Mm -hmm. When we study and we get grades that are better than our study habit, mm -hmm. we can say that was a miracle from God. When God heals, when people were saying, oh, you only have two days to live and you end up living two years and 20 years, we don't need to say, that's not scientifically right. No, that's God. Mm -hmm. Christianity is not an enemy to science. They can all go together, but we must factor in those moments where God showers us with his sovereignty and we must welcome them, we must listen for them, and we must look for them because they come from God above. Friends, today we've talked about a great miracle, a miracle that is so underexplored 
by the church. And it's that God caused the sun to stand still because of Joshua and Israel's faithfulness. My hope for each of you as you're watching from right where you are is that we would model the faithfulness that Joshua and Israel had. My hope for you is that we will model this faithfulness. Why? Because God deserves it. And when we're faithful, he's always dispensing his sovereignty. If you don't know this God who sent Jesus, man, right where you are, I would love for you to accept Jesus into your heart. And so if you're interested in doing that, you can do it right now. But all you have to do is repeat this simple prayer. Let's pray together. God, I want to know you. God, I know you sent your son to die for me. God, I confess that Jesus is the Lord of my life. In Christ's name, amen. If you've just prayed that prayer, I'm so excited. If I could hit a back flip, I'd do it. But I don't want to end up in the hospital. But I do want to know about it. And if you would, let us know about it at all together at spdl.org. We would love to talk with you about what that means and help you and walk with you in your new journey of being a Christian. Hey, maybe you got some things going on in your life right now and you're fighting them by yourself. And hey, you need some miracles to happen in your life. Well, guess what, man? Hey, I'm not a miracle worker, but I know one. And that's God. And I'd love to pray with you. And so feel free at that same email address, all together at spdl.org. Hey, put your prayer request there. We'll reach out, I promise, in 24 hours. But lastly, friends, we have loved being with each of you, and we love having you virtually be with us. And if you want to keep this ministry going, you feel like, hey, man, I want to sow a, a gift, a big gift, a small gift, a dime, a penny, a million, whatever it is, hey, you can do that. All you got to do is go to spdl.org. There's a given option there. And under the drop down menu, you're going to see all together. Friends, as you keep thinking about this miracle of the still sun, looking and reflecting on Joshua chapter 10, 1 through 15, I have so enjoyed being with you. Although my preference would be that you be here with us, but I know why you can't be. But please know from right where you are, we're glad you worship with us. Our together takeaway is real short. It's God's sovereignty is always at work. God's sovereignty is always at work in all our lives, friends. Don't ever forget it. Continue to embrace it. And friends, have an amazing week. See you next week.